Well, welcome. Uh, I'm going to talk today about asynchronicity and concurrency in JavaScript and the wider computer science sphere as well. We're going to go through some of the different uh, progressions and permutations of asynchronous JavaScript, and I'll try and explain them at a fundamental level. So a bit about me. My name is Mark McKeveney. I'm a software engineer at Squarefoot, a um, company here in Belfast. We build commercial real estate software. Day-to-day, uh, -day I work with React, Rails, um, data pipelines in Python, and a bit of AWS and DevOps in there too. So what does asynchronous actually mean? Um, the dictionary definition is something that is not happening or done at the same time or speed. In order to understand this at a um, computing context, we need to look at the processor. So the processor is what's responsible for executing our programs, uh, the central part of the computer. The programs keep the processor busy until they've done their work, and the speed at which something like a loop that manipulates a bunch of numbers and iterates over them is pretty much entirely dependent on the speed of the processor. But not all programs iterate over numbers. Some programs need to do things outside of the processor. Make a network request, uh, read from a disk. It would be a shame to let the processor sit idle while this thing happens. So this is where asynchronicity comes in. It lets us move on to the next task while the previous one is still running. And we can wait for it to finish. So how does the computer actually handle this? It's the operating system that's able to switch the processor between different programs. And that's fine, but it doesn't help us when we have a single program where we wanted to continue on doing some work while something else is happening in the background. Put simply, a processor only knows how to execute an instruction. It doesn't have the concept of doing two things at one time. So the OS simulates this by allocating different slices of time um, to different tasks and gives each one a little bit of time to do some work. Now, when we introduce more cores and more processors, this changes. We're able to allocate um, different slices of work into what are called threads, and we can allocate one block of time um, on one processor on one thread, and allocate the same block of time on another processor on another thread, and that lets us run things in parallel. Knowing the difference between that uh, multi-threaded parallel model and the single-threaded concurrent model is an important distinction to grasp. So we'll throw an analogy at it. It's a, it's a Friday, you know, you're, you're going for lunch, you're going to Five Guys, you're lining up in the queue, you're gonna get a burger, uh, maybe a milkshake for your own enjoyment, or to chuck at a politician, based on if you've <laughs> been listening to the news recently. You're standing in the queue, you walk up, you order your burger, you get a ticket, and you wait with all the other people. Your name gets called, your number gets called, you go up, you get your burger, happy days. So a few weeks later, you might go to Five Guys and you realize that it's absolutely queued out the door. You look up at the front and you notice that the person at the front is ordering their burger, waiting for it to be completely made, handed to them, and then they're on their way. It's absolutely queued out the door. This is the difference between a synchronous and asynchronous model. So to take this analogy further, we can actually use that to explain the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Concurrency is one Five Guys employee putting the tomato on one burger, the cheese on another, uh, the bun on another, handing it over. And even though they're working on many burgers at once, they're still only allocating one slice of time to each one. Parallelism, on the other hand, is two or more Five Guys employees standing around a burger, making it, finishing it, moving on to the next one. So why is this difficult? Like, why, why do people have problems with this? So this is a question that's on Stack Overflow. It has nearly 5,000 upvotes. And this person is trying to uh, define a function, call it, make an asynchronous call, um, get the result from the asynchronous call, and assign it to the variable and return it. Anyone who's done a bit of JavaScript will know this doesn't work. Calls the function, defines the variable, the async call goes out, and then it moves on to the next line. So the result is undefined. Now, this is a tricky thing to understand, and I'm going to go into this now, how this actually works. So this is JavaScript from a bird's eye view, how the engine works. And I'll show this a few times uh, throughout the talk because it's important to understand how all these pieces are fitting together. But we have, for now, the JavaScript runtime with our execution stack here, you know, the functions that are running in your application. And we have the web APIs. So set timeout, the timer, that's not a JavaScript thing. That's a browser thing. Ajax, JavaScript doesn't know how to make network requests. It's the browser that does that. Uh, same with uh, reading for a, from a file in Node or interacting with the DOM, all browser things. So JavaScript runtime needs to know, okay, I wanna do this browser thing. It reaches out to the web APIs and says, let me know when you're done. So how, how do we write asynchronous JavaScript? The easiest and the most, uh, the oldest version of this is callbacks. And it's fairly simple, you know, a function that calls back when the asynchronous task is complete. Let me know when X is finished. These are versatile, you know, they're just functions. And for the same reason, they're performant you know, low overhead there. And they're fairly easy to grasp conceptually. As I said, you know, let me know when this thing's done. 
So how do we use callback? This is a node script that reads from a file, and we define a callback at the end, a function there, and say, when this file has finished reading, run the callback. Now, it's quite easy to get confused here and think that this whole thing is going to run before it hits the next line, but that's not the case. All we're saying is here, when this is done, run the function. So then it moves on, console.logs me first, the execution stack's empty, and then our callback gets run. So if we refer back to this, how, how does this happen? We can't just let an asynchronous task be done and just jam that function onto the main execution stack. It needs to go somewhere else, and that's where the callback queue comes in. When the task is done from a web API, it pops the function onto a callback queue, and then once the main stack is empty, it executes that, it puts it onto the main call stack and then executes it. And the whole thing that's coordinating this is the event loop. It's just a loop that runs and checks the status of all these different pieces to uh, find out what to run next. So callbacks are great and all, and they've got us pretty far, but what people started to realize was you ended up pretty quickly with code like this. You did an asynchronous call, you needed to use it in another asynchronous call, you had to do error handling, you had lots and lots of stuff here. Uh, and you ended up with this kind of code here, which is a nightmare to maintain and a nightmare to read. So how do we solve this problem, and how do we make it better? This is when promises were introduced to the language, and the difference between the promise and the callback is a callback's just a thing you define to say, run this when this is finished, but the promise lets us hold on to the reference of a future value in JavaScript. It's a bridge between the JavaScript runtime and the browser APIs. So they're a thin but powerful abstraction around callbacks. They're chainable. We can do dot then, dot then, dot then. Um, and, and it saves us from having that pyramid of doom callback hell scenario that we saw previously. And we have nice error handling. We can catch an error through the whole promise chain and it will fall into that when something goes wrong. And they're composable because we actually have a reference to the future value in JavaScript and we can pass that around our application. So how do we, how do we use promises? Now, in order to understand promises, it's actually worth looking a bit deeper. Um, there's two values that are on a promise that you can't actually access in JavaScript, but they're in the engine. And that's the value and the unfulfilled array. So we define a function up here, um, display, and we define a, um, a promise in the future data variable. Fetch is just a browser API that lets us do a network request and it returns a promise. At this stage, under the hood, the promise has a value of undefined because it hasn't returned yet, and the unfulfilled array is empty. Unfulfilled is an array of functions that run when the value gets updated. We then call future data dot then display, um, then is a confusing one because a lot of people, I think, read that and think that when the promise resolves, it'll jump back up to that line of code, but that's not the case. Then pops a function into the unfulfilled array, and when the, prompt, where the value is updated, it runs that um, passed in function and passes in the data. So console.log me first happens, and then we get the response from our promise. The value gets updated, it's data from server, and obviously we have our unfulfilled function. That gets run and we pass in data from server and log that out. Now this below, this is actually from the JavaScript spec of what happens when you use promise.then. And there's a bit of jargon here, but it's actually quite easy to understand. So if the promise is pending, um, the promise hasn't resolved yet, and we call .then, we append a fulfill reaction that's the last element of the list that is promise fulfill reactions. If the promise is fulfilled, then let the value, the value here, be the promise result and perform in queue job. So what does that mean? I mentioned before that there's the callback queue for your event handlers, um, async callbacks with node um, functions. But in this case, promises actually have their own queue. And that's known as the job queue in the JavaScript spec, but it's more commonly known as the microtask queue. So what's, what's the difference? How, how does a uh, microtask queue get executed? How does the callback queue get executed? The important thing to um, understand is the microtask queue gets executed first after the main call stack's emptied. So in this example, we define a couple of functions, display, print hello, and block for 300 milliseconds. We call set timeout with a print hello return, or a print hello callback um, after zero milliseconds. So you would think this would run straight away, but that's not the case because the main execution stack isn't empty. We move on, um, we save as the last example, the future data variable, it's assigned to a fetch, and then we say when that returns, we want to call the display function. Bear in mind that neither the promise callback nor the set timeouts run at this point. We then block for 300 milliseconds. We console.log me first. Now we empty the microtask queue. The promise callback gets executed with display. And then the last piece that gets executed is the callback queue, which has our set timeout callback. So print hello. And down below, that's actually the order that these things get printed out. So, so what's wrong with this, right? I mean, promises made callbacks better, but you're still using callback. You're passing in a function saying, run this when you're done. So how can we actually make this better? And the only way to really 
make async JavaScript easier to understand is to make it look synchronous. So with the current model, we, we couldn't do that. So what they came up with was generators. Now generators are just pausable functions and they're extremely powerful because they let us pause in the middle of a function, run some other code in the meantime, and then jump back in as and when. So we define our number generator. Uh, we define that with a function star, that's the notation for a generator. And then we instantiate the generator. So we instantiate the generator and we can call dot next, which is give me another value, give me another value. So we do jump dot next, it jumps into the generator. We have this yield keyword, which says return that one and kick us back out. So we pause the generator on line two and we go back to our main execution stack. We get a value of one and you get a done key back, which is whether or not the generator's finished or not. We call dot next again. It picks up where it left off and goes to two. We get a value of two, done is false. We call generator next, it goes back in, yield three, and we're done at this point. Now where this becomes quite powerful is when we actually use it for async code and uh, introduce like promises and stuff here. So in this example, we have a do when data receive function. We define a create flow generator and we instantiate it the same way as the last one. So we ask for the next element from the generator, jumps in, defines a data variable. And this looks confusing because you would think it would assign the, the yield fetch to the data, but it doesn't actually do that. Yield is a super powerful keyword. It'll actually kick us straight back out of the generator. But it'll take the uh, value from the yield in the generator and assign it to future data here. So this future data is now the promise from line seven. We then call dot then and say when this resolves, we want to run the do when data receive function. Main execution stack's now empty. So microtask queue gets executed, do when data received gets run, and we say dot next on the generator. Now the response from the promise, just for example's sake, is high from server and we call dot next, but we pass in a value. So what happens here is quite interesting. It basically replaces the whole yield with whatever you passed into the next. So const data now equals high from server, and then it logs out that response. Now that's quite a convoluted example, but it demonstrates the next part, which I think is like one of the best JavaScript features that's ever came out, and it really, really solves this problem. And that's async await. Async await, this, code example does exactly the same thing as the previous code example, but it just hides a lot of the complexity away. Async await wouldn't be possible without generators. I mean, we can't await, we can't stop anything without having generators or possible functions. So we define an async function rather than a generator, and that says this is an asynchronous function, and that returns a promise always, because if you remember, it's a pausable function, so we can't make that synchronous. We have to have some kind of way to wait on that. We call create flow, so it jumps in, console.log me first, assigns data to await fetch, and await is similar to yield. So a lot of people get confused here and think that this will just stop until this is done, but that's not the case. Await's like yield, and it kicks us back out into the main execution stack. Console.logs me second. Microtask queue now has the promise callback, so it jumps back into the paused async function and logs out the response from the promise. So when it comes to async, await, uh, generators, all that stuff, it's all great, but it can be a bit of a nightmare when you have really complex asynchronous logic. Um, you have a lot of conditional stuff in there. And one thing that's actually really powerful for this and that might be good to reach for is the observable. So observables are different to promises. Promises is one value. Let me know when this network request is returned. Um, whereas observables are streams of value, streams of clicks, streams of network um, requests, and we can subscribe to those streams. So for a basic example, we define an event listener um, for a click, you know, we click a button, it updates an output with click. The observable equivalent is down here, and we use a library called RxJS, which is uh, probably by far the de facto most popular observable library for JavaScript. Um, this is, uh, there's actually been a lot of proposals to add observables into the language itself. So we say from event, um, click, like button click, we have a stream of button clicks. We subscribe to that, and then for each button click, we then update the output. So where this becomes really powerful is if you wanted to do something like only update the text content when uh, on every third click. Now doing that with the normal callback, you would need some kind of state there, maybe wrap it in the closure or something like that to keep track and to reset every time the handler's fired. Whereas with RxJS and observables, we can just pipe our click events into this operator. An operator, there's tons of operators in RxJS. They're just functions that let us map over our stream um, events. So buffer count is, Buffer, buffer, buffer until you reach this count of events, in our case three, and then emit. 
So on the third click, the output will be updated. So there's a case here for a, um, like a deeper understanding of JavaScript. I think that the more your mind like diverges away from the way the JavaScript engine works, the more likely your code is to be incorrect and you're gonna have bugs. So I think it's actually a uh, time well spent to look into how this stuff works at a fundamental level. So a fundamental understanding of the engine, uh, execution context, scoping, things like that really help you write correct JavaScript. Um, and one way to do this is the definitive resource, which is the JavaScript spec. And you saw a little cutout from it there. And it is quite intimidating at first, but there's lots of good articles online, of, including this one, of how to actually read it. And if you want to know how a double equals operator works, why a type error is thrown, how strict mode works, it's all in the spec. And it's an excruciating detail. So I would highly recommend having a look at this stuff and dipping in and out of the spec. I don't read it start to finish. No one has that sort of time. But doing it um, bit by bit is super helpful for deepening your understanding of JavaScript. Another nice thing is just the experiment with things like Code Sandbox. Go on, write some code that you would never write in a production app. Mix promises, callbacks, whatever it may be. Play around with scope, play around with prototypes, and really, really get the grips with how these things actually work. It, it, it'll bring you on leaps and bounds with your understanding. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, that's good. That's the, yeah, that's the intention. I understand promises. What's happening? So <laughs> it's not JavaScript friendly. How about anyone in the audience that would like to take more questions? We have lots of time for questions. So. Wow. I see. Thank you for right? moving your questions. That was really good. <laughs> I, I just love how you actually, like, people are always trying to solve problems all the time and they don't really get a chance for that deeper understanding. and. Um, I didn't even know there was a guide on how to read the spec, so that's, <laughs> you know, because it isn't yeah. obvious, it's like... Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw it, it may as well have been written in Chinese, you know, it's like, right. so reading those documents has helped me massively to, like, really understand what's happening there. Yeah. And it's good, because sometimes you see certain um, implementations of the language, different things, and they actually don't match the spec, and then you know that and go, oh, this differs from the way that it's meant to be. Cool, cool. And so when did that sort of uh, deeper dive start for you? Um, I think it's something I've always kind of been interested in because I've run into those problems that we saw in the Stack Overflow answer where, like, why is this not working? You know, why is it not working like a Python script or a Ruby script or whatever? Mm. So I decided, like, what, what actually happens on the Ruby? And there's so many good resources online to get that. And I think by knowing that, you can step through JavaScript programs and really understand what's happening there and hopefully avoid less bugs and get woke up at 4 o'clock in the future. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. Ah, so it's actually going to, you're going to sleep better. Yep. <laughs> okay, and everyone's like, yes. And async is apparently really awesome, so yeah, we're definitely. all convinced now. So fabulous. I think there weren't any questions from here, but certainly, um, you know, in the halls and afterwards, there's going to be just so you know a short, um, a short break, and then a final kind of like, you know, moment at the end of the conference. So I'd like to say a big thank you very much. This is really